to the finest crew in Starfleet. Engage. Watch your back, son. I'm Luke. I'm Captain Captain Jingwe, the USS Voyager. Captain Captain Jingwe, the USS Voyager. Captain Captain. Welcome to the Greatest Generation. Star Trek podcast by a couple of guys just a little bit embarrassed about having a Star Trek podcast. I'm Adam Pranica. I'm Ben Harrison. <laughs> you seem worried, Adam. I clapped and nothing happened with the puppy in the studio, so that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> Usually the clapping can instigate some things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, when we uh, when we record, it's always like turn off notifications, silence all of the devices. But uh, but then you go and make the chaos choice of having puppy in studio with you. The thing about clap is clap is like dog aloha. Mm. It could mean hello. It could mean get the attention. It could mean shut the fuck up. Yeah, it could mean you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, just like aloha. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ever get pulled over in Hawaii? You get aloha <laughs> Aloha, sir. Do you have any idea how fast you were going? <laughs> oh, that's a threatening aloha. Don't like that one. I was just driving home. I'm in a loner car right now. Whoa. Uh, a little uh, fender bender. Somebody, uh, somebody bumped into my wife. Mm. I'm in the loner. This car does not drive the way my car does. I, like it is such a head fuck to go back to a gas engine after electric because yeah. you like see a lane that's open on the freeway and you're like I'm gonna speed up and get in that lane and it's like I'm not speeding up at all. What's going on? <laughs> Regenerative braking feels like uh, when you get into a car without it, you're kind of sliding all the time. Yeah, like, it feels very icy. Yeah, right. It's like a level in a video game where uh, <laughs> where the floor is slippery. Yeah. I don't like that sensation. I have a confession to make, Adam. Um, Uh-oh. Having, Did you also wreck this car? I wasn't with my wife when the, the person sideswiped her. And uh, it's just had me all out of sorts. And I've uh, mm. been going out in the world and um, trying bits on people I probably shouldn't be trying bits on. <laughs> Your wife's car accident has has made you go out and do bits. What is she doing? She's probably <laughs> not, right? She's fine? No, she's normal. We should also tell the people that she's fine, right? Uninjured? She's fine. And Darone? She was parked. The baby wasn't with her. Oh, good. This guy okay. was turning into a... Uh, <laughs> I mean, hilariously, he was tr- turning into a parking lot and hit her parallel parked car while she was mm. sitting in it. And then, like, hopped out of his car with his uh, camera phone rolling, trying to, like, document the scene of the accident uh, with with her being the person at fault in the narrative that he was speaking into the microphone. That's great. Like, it's bad driver TMZ yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Great. Yeah, he was wrong. Insurance uh-huh. company found him to be the one at fault. Uh <laughs> A bunch of people with sports bottles talking about a minor fender bender at in some cubicles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that unmistakable green straw. Yeah. <laughs> All this is to say that I've been having some bad bit moments, Adam. I would like to hear about these. All I do is bits, bits, bits. No matter what, you're always doing bits, bits, bits. No matter what, you're always doing bits, bits, bits. I was doing bits. Bad bit moment. Bad bit moment. So today when I was at the shop and uh, they had a loaner car for me, I was out by, I was actually out by where uh, Danny Baruela lives, Danny from uh, Maximum Fun. Got a cup of coffee with him in between dropping off the car and picking up the uh, the loaner vehicle. Uh huh. And uh, that was very nice. But uh, when when I went in to get the loaner, they you know they send you around. There's different windows, and I like signed out with the service department guy, and then I went over to the loaner car department window to get my loaner. And they're having it's like renting a car. You know, you got to like initial three places and sign on multiple different forms. You know, it's like. Prove you have insurance. Uh, agree that your insurance is going to cover anything that happens to the car. Do you have the automobile insurance that covers your rental? I'm not being charged for this loaner, so I guess I must. I'm not sure. Hey, great. Yeah. 
I mean, that's like the next level pain in the ass of a car accident is like, oh, great. Now I got to pay for this shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have to pay a deductible, but uh, hey, we're done with the deductible in January. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the rest of the year I can just drive by Braille, you know? That's great. <laughs> Good job. But uh, <laughs> suddenly there's red text on this form and it says, no smoking. And that's its own like bright red, bold text area of the uh, form that I have to initial in. And I said, now, um, I don't think this is going to be a problem for me, but my wife is smoking hot. Is it all right if she gets in the car? Oh, God. All I do is fits, fits, fits. No matter what. Hey, describe the person you're talking to before the reaction. Just a mustachioed Latinx man that works in a car business context. Do you even think about sizing people up before dropping a bit on them? Like, did you look at this guy and think yes? Or or were you just thinking about yourself? I saw a man that might enjoy a little bit of humor. He was joking around with some of the other people that worked there. I wasn't All right. okay. like talking to a no joke. All right, which I feel like you can kind of see coming. But there are people, I might be, I might consider myself one of them. Some people have a tough time joking around with somebody that they haven't established a certain rapport with. Oh, yeah. And yeah. what this guy gave me back was, yes, your wife can drive the car, uh, but, you know, you're only covered for spousal. <laughs> you know why he had to go full professional there? It's because in a, in a business context, he can't say anything about the hotness of your wife. <laughs> like, what is he supposed to do there? Yeah, no, it was a bad bit. It was not his fault. It was my fault. <laughs> hey, let's play the scene, okay? <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll play the guy behind the desk right. and what he could have said. All right, okay. So, uh, okay. all right, initialing for, uh, yeah, I do have insurance. Uh, I am licensed to drive. Oh, um... I just have a question about this, um, no smoking in the car. My wife is smoking hot. Is that all right? Well, I don't know. Can I see some pictures? <laughs> <laughs> see? There, what do you do besides business? I got a little smile out of him because he, was, he said, like, your cousin, your son, uh, they cannot drive the car. And I said, well, my son's only five months old, so I definitely won't be putting him behind the wheel. And he gave me a little smile for that one. Uh, what's the rule about really hot sons? <laughs> and then shit just gets fucking weird. <laughs> he is a bit of a hunk. <laughs> Have you seen how hot my baby is? And he's like, let me see some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so that was this morning. Wow. A couple days prior, I'm in the doctor's office. We've been having some heartburn. I think we've got this narrowed down to just like holiday eating and drinking heartburn. This is not a mental disorder. This is a physical affliction. <laughs> yeah. The doctor was like, all right, so I'm going to put you on this, uh, This, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's not Prilosec, but it's something like that. It's a one a day pill that, you know, reduces stomach acid, is meant to uh, help you with acid reflux. Mm -hmm. So take this for two weeks. If you're still having it, I want you to stop for two weeks and wait two weeks. And then we need to do a a fecal sample to test you for some like bacterial things that it could be. If like, if this doesn't work, then it could be this bacteria, but we need to flush this out of your system before we can test for that. Cause you can get false negatives if you're, if you're taking medication. I don't know, man, it sure seems like upper GI would not have to deal with a fecal sample. You would you know? think, but you know, I'm no doctor. I'm not here to question what my doctor is telling me. So I sat there in the in the room, and the nurse came in uh, with like a big like like, like a grocery yeah. bag, <laughs> all the stuff in it. Because there's the plastic hat that you put in the yeah. toilet for collecting the poop sombrero. Yeah, and then like a you know a little jar that you put it. You know, you're not supposed to bring in the entire sombrero. You just <laughs> you collect a small amount. And, and put it in a jar and bring that in. Does the sombrero have like, you know, like the, the measuring glasses? Like, are, are the, is there a little pore spout that uh. <laughs> facilitates that? Or is the expectation that you're supposed to go in there with like a spoon <laughs> and fill up your other container with it? 
So that is a great question because then she shows me how to collect and she pulls out the tongue depressor, the like j- jumbo popsicle stick. Uh, oh. And she says, you're, you're going to collect it with this. And I said, uh, and now can I use it to depress my tongue after? All I do is fits, fits, fits. No matter what. <laughs> the nurse did not care for that line of comedy while she is uh. going through the, uh, the poop collection procedure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you want to use the blue one for that, Ben. <laughs> wow. You got nothing from that. No. See, I my question about that is um a tongue depressor wouldn't work for me. Yeah. Because I'd need I'd need something like a turkey baster. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like we're dealing with solids on your side. Right, right. Like what happens if it's just like a gallon of iced tea? This is why you want the spout on your sombrero. Right. I definitely need the poor spout on the sombrero. I feel like yours maybe better would be like something like a gravy separator, you know? Oh, yeah. Like one of those modern ones where the you push the button on the handle and it opens something on the bottom <laughs> so that you're not like f- fucking around with trying to pour some out with without the fat getting in. What's great is the effect is totally the same from from making it. Like <laughs> you and I agree that one of the funniest things John Gabris has ever said was describing a bowel movement as a crabbing ship <laughs> dropping the uh, the basket onto the deck. <laughs> and that's like uh, that's the same thing, right? Like I'm dropping it into the poop and sombrero, and then pouring the poop and sombrero into the gravy separator, and then that is dropping it again. Yeah. Into the container. Yeah, yeah. For the science to be done on it. Yeah, I mean, it's cool that they put the the graduation marks on the poop sombrero, so you can ju- see just how much volume you're producing. You know, it wasn't that long ago, Ben, when you were positively cringing at the idea of me even attempting to tell a poop story, and here we are. Yeah. It's a delight for everyone. <laughs> I guess the sombrero is on the other head today, my friend. Yeah, really is. Uh, well, it was all theoretical poop in my story. So, did you keep the sombrero? Yeah, it's all. I think that's a good idea. It's all here. This medication seems to be working, so I unfortunately don't think I'm going to be able to uh, regale the friends of Desoto with uh, an anecdote about actually collecting this sample. It's better to have a poop sombrero and not use it <laughs> than. Uh, did you hit a pothole in the middle of that? Then need one and not have it, right? <laughs> Sombrero is kind of a hard word to say sometimes, <laughs> especially when you're fucked up. Speaking of hurls that uh, are one way. Mm. Oh, you're talking about today's episode? Do you want to talk about today's episode? <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, stumbling through the pivot. <laughs> We'll get there, Ben. How dare you? It's Star Trek Voyager Season 5, Episode 13. Gravity. Reverse course. Unless you've got something a little bigger in your torpedo tubes. I'm not turning around. <laughs> a first time director on this episode. Really? Something to note. A first time uh, Voyager director, anyway. Kind of an interesting cold open here. We're in mm-hmm. some Star Trek caves, lots of uh, gongs and monoliths, which definitely reads as Vulcan. Yeah. Like before you even see pointy ears, you're like, this is, this is some Vulcan shit going on right here. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like when you go to Spain and you see a Gaudi. Like, you just know what a Gaudi looks like. You also just know what Vulcan looks like. It's gongs and bells. (laughs) (laughs) It's Vulcan Gaudi. Yeah, yeah. That's actually what you say on Vulcan in lieu of bells and whistles. Uh Oh, man, I got a top-of-the-line car. I got all the gongs and bells. Impressive. (laughs) Yeah, teen Tuvok walks in and he's like, when are they ever going to finish this Vulcan teen center? It's been under construction for like a hundred years. Yeah, it is um, kind of an interesting teen center. Like uh, you'd you'd think that they would wear different clothes if you're going to flip the folding chair around and sit on it backwards. But this guy uh, comes out in full robes to talk to young Tuvok. Yeah, young Tuvok... uh, Jeez. Really not doing great in school. No. His dad has sent him to the teen center. And uh, this is sort of like scared straight. Except for Vulcans, it's not scared straight. It's it's logic straight, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You don't want to get on on that bad path if you're Teen Tuvok falling in love with people. Teen Tuvok is a wayward teen in the most straight and narrow sense of the word. Yeah. He's in love with a girl and everybody's horrified by that. So, uh, yeah. Including the girl, it turns out. (laughs) Yeah. Jara doesn't return my feelings. He is being asked to uh, recommit himself to Vulcan logic and he's like, fuck that. Why was I born with these feelings if I'm not supposed to have them? And, uh, Basically, in one fell swoop, completely undermines the entire point of being a Vulcan. Yeah. Wow. He's really fallen off the logic wagon. Yeah. You can tell. My emotions free me. I see. It's hard to tell if this is, like, this doesn't seem to be a time in a Vulcan's life type of episode, right? This isn't, like, Ponfar or anything. This is just teenage doubt. Like... I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, do all Vulcan teens go through a sort of, like, logic puberty where <laughs> they decide that love is bad and, and crushes are dangerous and so forth? Yeah. We don't know that. You may have noticed that some curly hairs have started to appear on your logic, and that's totally normal. Yeah. Look, when you're standing next to another Vulcan at the urinal, you may notice other Vulcans are, are growing those hairs at a different rate than you are and that's okay (laughs) do not let that make you angry because anger is an emotion (laughs) so is jealousy (laughs) you don't want either of those (laughs) so that's our cold open and we go to theme do you think he's having wet emotions at night Mm. (laughs) thinking about his classmate yeah yeah that does kind of put you in a state of denial doesn't it like uh like well no nothing well, you can't control what happens in your sleep, is what I'm saying. Like, how traumatic does that have to be? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a logic denier. There's there's no way around it. Young Tuvok yeah. was a logic denier. He donated a lot of money to the Stop the Steal, parenthetical of emotions campaign. Well, I mean, there are terrorists that are logic deniers, and we've encountered them in Star Trek. There's logic extremists and logic deniers, and Vulcan yeah. needs to get these people under control. Yeah. I mean, there are probably very good Vulcans on both sides. Well, that's why they, uh, you know, not because anybody was particularly enthusiastic about it, but that's why they ultimately elected to Biden. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. He's fine. (laughs) He's fine. All right. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, we come back from theme and we are, uh, we're in like planet Death Valley. Looks hot as hell. It's dry unpleasant looking and a uh, a lone character is walking in this desert that's full of crashed starships hunting spiders at him. yeah how'd you like to eat a spitter this big it probably tastes like a lobster or something right i don't know i mean that's the thing that the crab analog was really apparent here once the spider gets as big as a crab mm-hmm mm-hmm it's like the uh, the uncanny valley has been <laughs> leapt at that point. Like, it's not as gross anymore. Yeah. Well, that's why this is set in Uncanny Death Valley. Yeah. I mean, I was immediately distracted by the Lori Petty credit because you know anything she's involved in is going to be interesting. Yeah. But the face covering, I think, is meant to hide her a little bit more than she can ever be hidden, right? I feel like... Back when everyone was wearing masks all the time, like you heard some celebrities say that like, yeah, it was actually really cool to feel kind of anonymous. Yeah. Like walking through busy places. I feel like Lori Petty does not get to do that because the upper part of her face is so like beautiful and unique. Like you absolutely know what Lori Petty's face is for the three inches around her eyes. Yeah. Oh, I'm so pretty. She's got piercing peepers, yeah. and uh, she squints them up at the sky, and we see a, uh, oh. a hurl up there, and uh, something's coming out of it, Adam. Yeah. Something drops out of that hole, <laughs> which is how things should come out of the hole. Like, not any straining, not yeah. any pushing. No. The shuttle just kind of falls out. Nice, clean separation, and yeah. uh, you hear the crash, and she pulls out some... Uh, binoculars and zeroes in on it and it is a voyager shuttle we cut right on over to it and Lori petty gets into the shuttle via gaping hole like the <laughs> shuttle is not flying again it has been ripped apart like a soda can 
Yeah, it's in really rough shape. Some of the panels inside are still blinking, but uh, does not look space worthy by any extent. You would think that the occupants would be dead, judging from how it looks, right? You would think. And judging from the noted lack of uh, safety restraints that we've observed in shuttles before. Yeah. But there are no occupants to be found, and she gets on board and starts, you know, going through stuff, kind of rifling through the the console and the glove compartment. She starts going for the catalytic converter. She drops the sunshade. There's no keys under there. Fuck. They're always there in movies, but never in real life. You know what? Just going off of memory, are there those flip down sunshades on the shuttlecraft? It seems like there would be. Yeah. Or there should be. Right. I mean, can they just polarize the view screen if they need to? I guess. Yeah. But that's not as fun. What is fun is uh, Tom Paris coming back to the shuttle with his action jacket open and, you know, finds her in there and uh, she's, she aims her gun at him and starts speaking an untranslatable language. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Sin! Nima, sin! It is great when you have a mask covering your face for using a, an alien language, right? Because they can loop this dialogue later and make it sound like however they want it to sound. <laughs> they really can. This is a good benefit to production, I think. Yeah. Also, just uh, good lighting for this, right? Because it's so bright outside yeah. that the, the shadows inside the shuttle are really dark. And uh, yeah, she looks real scary. She takes his uh, his med kit and makes for the hills, but is pretty quickly set upon by a couple of very loafy aliens. And they're about to get her when uh, she's saved by the Tuvok. Yeah. Our course is locked in. Do it. Listen to me very carefully because I'm only going to say this once. Do it. I love a Tuvok fight scene because it involves a lot of open hand strikes. Yeah. And open hand strikes always look like martial arts, you know? He's super into that move where you like drive the nose bone up into the brain. Yeah, that's the thing. Like the lethality of the open hand strike is greater than just punching people. It seems like it is. Yeah. But maybe these aliens don't keep their nose bone the same place you and I do. Yeah. Not everybody does. That's fair. He also deploys the neck pinch while these guys are down. That's good. Which is another great bit of luck. That works, you know? Yeah, how does that work? <laughs> so they don't keep the noses in the same place, but they keep the, the nerve? I guess so. In the same place? Hmm. Uh, I've got a question. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been to a Star Trek convention. You could say it's been a, a long time. Anyways. I got a question about uh, Star Trek Voyager Season 5, Episode 13, Gravity. So Tuvok gets in this open-handed street fight. And I know that that's a bit of a head fake. You thought I was going to ask something about Enterprise, but this is about Voyager, actually. Right. So he's, he's, he's hitting these people with an open hand, which looks familiar to anyone who watches martial arts movies. But these aliens, they get neck pinched. Am I to believe that most aliens keep the nerve useful for neck pinching in the same part of their body? I'm gonna take the answer in the merch shop, <laughs> where I always go after a asking a question. <laughs> the merch shop, the most interesting place of any convention. Gotta get out of here. Yeah. Get a life. Yeah, they just leave these guys out in the desert and that's like kind of a dark ending to the scene. Yeah, they're just fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, you leave anyone out in the blazing desert sun, they're going to be dead in like an hour, right? Yeah, yeah. Just laying on the ground. I thought it was fucked up that he buried them up to their necks. Oh, yeah. And then like it hit a nearby anthill with a stick. Yeah. To feast on our naked heads. <laughs> that was fucked up. Pretty brutal. So he's he's like, oh my God, I'm uh, so sorry those guys attacked you. Let me, let me take you back to my shuttle. And then he's like helping her pick up her stuff and realizes that most of her stuff is his stuff. Yeah, that's awkward, right? Maybe he should have uh, beat her up and helped those other guys. His issue of big Vulcan naturals <laughs> <laughs> rolled up in her bag. <laughs> yeah, and she's like, ah, oh, he's into big naturals? Well, he'll never like me. I mean, how do you think 
Tuvok got so chill. <laughs> He's not going into any situation with a loaded weapon. That's what they taught him in the Star Trek caves when yeah. he was a young man. <laughs> Listen, you know, sometimes you just got to take the edge off, Tuvok. <laughs> You do not want to use a black light in those caves. <laughs> those are not hieroglyphics. This is, uh, we find out when he makes it back to the shuttle, a pocket of subspace that they're in. It's like a whole solar system that's not in regular space. And they're like, they're talking about how fucked they are while they do a little bit of first aid on this lady, Nos, which is what we come to know Lori Petty's name is. They can't even like get a distress signal out because the subspace barrier around this little solar system thing is uh, is bouncing the signal right back at them. This part goes by so fast, but I think it's crucial to remember that like this planet and maybe other planets are inside this hole. Oh. Yeah. They're not in normal space. They're nowhere normal, man. Yeah. Tuvok has a way with Nas that is like how some people are able to get along with cats. Like, you're one of these people. Oh, yeah. Cats love me. Cats just naturally like you. But Nas does not seem predisposed to liking or trusting anyone. But in this short amount of time, she's come around to trusting Tuvok here. Part of it is that he's giving her food and medical attention. Right. But I think another part is they're just kind of hitting it off. They're two, they're two good-looking people. <laughs> In a dangerous situation, feelings are going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know what my secret is, Adam, is um, if I ever see a cat getting attacked by aliens, I'll beat up the aliens, and the cat kind of is instantly predisposed to trusting me. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. That's how you do it. So uh, so they're kind of like talking the situation over when she says, Gren, Gren, and they're like, oh, shit, we got to get out of here. Gren, Gren can't be good. And... uh the logic is she must have somewhere safe to hang out because this ain't it, and uh, and they go with her. Pay no attention to the leap it takes to believe that this is the truth. Like, <laughs> she says something they don't understand. A bunch of people are approaching. I guess what other choice did they have but to trust her? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the you know, trust is earned, but like they've kind of uh, they've kind of led with. Uh, some positive energy. They're not, yeah. you know, beating her up after she tried to steal all their shit. Yeah, if Tuvok was going to hit her with an open hand in the nose part or neck pincher, it would have happened by now. Yeah. Did her digs remind you? You remember that, like, misery episode of TNG where Picard is marooned on a planet with a lady? It'll be a while before you can walk. I thought about that episode a lot, yeah. I feel like her apartment looks exactly the same. It really does. Yeah. Yeah, but Lori Petty's character here is crushing on Tuvok in a kind of normalized depiction of a crush. Yeah. And not a unhinged, <laughs> <laughs> willing to harm the object of your affection kind of crush. Right. Almost right. done. Just one more. At no point does she hit him in the leg with a hammer. God, I love you. This is a, a crashed vessel. It's got a force field around it, so it's pretty safe. She's got all the facilities you would need to cook and eat spiders all the live long day. It seems great. Yeah. It seems like they could live here a long time if they wanted to. Yeah. Maybe pick up the local language, you know? Yeah. Paris has been given an order by Tuvok to get the doctor back in, in working order as fast as he can. The uh, mobile emitter, unlike them, <laughs> sustained some damage <laughs> during yeah. the crash. And, uh, Figures, right? Paris gets it up and running pretty quickly. I liked this effect of him like holding the emitter and the like. I don't quite know how they did that. He kind of uh, Spider Man's him out of uh, his wrist, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. She, uh, Lori Petty, very surprised that this goes down when it does. But uh, the fortunate news is that the doctor can talk to her. Yeah. This is great. He's got the universal translator baked right in. I thought that the universal translator was in their badges. Why would it work on the, on the mobile emitter but not the badge? Because things that are badge-sized or mobile emitter-sized were tossed around the inside of that shuttle oh. when it crashed. Why couldn't they repair their badges then? I don't know, Ben. I don't know. 
Anyways, uh, he's able to explain his existence in a staggeringly quick amount of time. <laughs> this must be one of those really efficient spoken languages. Like you can get really complex ideas across in these little like monosyllabic spurts. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> like, do you remember how many times in TNG somebody materialized on the transporter and was like, what the fuck? And Data had to explain his entire deal to them. Yeah. I feel like every three episodes, they had to spend five or 10 minutes on that. This goes by like that. I know. We expedite her backstory pretty fast. Yeah. She's been there a long time, and that makes everyone pretty sad. Yeah. Because she's seen a lot of ships fall out of this butthole, but none of them have taken off again. It's weird, right? You see things in the sky operated by people who know how to fly them, but not how to land them. Mm. Pretty suspicious if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then what's her deal? Is she also one of those people? <laughs> it's like, why didn't she want to learn how to land? Why didn't she want to report this? Yeah. Seems very suspicious. I know you don't want to do it. Do it. Coffee black. Make it yourself. I'm trying to help you see this as an opportunity to grow. Make it yourself. We cut some indeterminate amount of time into the future, and it's Tom Paris trying to learn to spider trap with her. Yeah. Come back, you little bloodsucker. <laughs> He's trying to use the same fork implement that she does. I was like, use your phaser, man. Set it on a wide beam. It's going to be really easy. Whoa. That's a great call. Yeah, he's using a stupid knife like an idiot. Fucking moron. When Lori Petty shows him the right way to do it, she's like, well, you need to yell very loudly <laughs> <laughs> when you use the quick stabbing motion of the knife. And that's something the Paris wasn't doing either. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I feel like a lot of guys feel like they have to be completely silent while they're doing it. Yeah, that's fair. Which isn't always fun, you know? No. You want to let the spider know that you're having a great time. Yeah. That it's working. Mm -hmm. Whatever the spider is doing down there is working. Tell the spider that you're going to stab it. Tell the spider that you're stabbing it. <laughs> Tell the spider that you stabbed it. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. They come home with a fucking sack full of spiders. Yeah. Like, yeah. evidently the lesson works. Yeah. It was like spider Halloween out there. And they went to the, the block where you get the full-size spiders. I know these are all digital effects spiders, but man, I would have loved a dump the sack of spiders out on the table like you go to a uh, like a crab pot restaurant, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, and, and there's like the corn and the potatoes and stuff. Like it's all dumped out on the table. Yeah. And you just use your hands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fun. A milk can supper of spiders. Yeah. They had like one rubber spider. Yeah. You know, because she had to hold it up the time that she caught it, The you know, in those two scenes. I wanted to know if, if this was a prop that you could buy. And sure enough, they did sell this at a prop auction, Ben. Oh, yeah. How much did it go for? Well, they anonymize how much the person pays, but you actually get to see who bought it. No And kidding. it's Garrett Wong. Whoa! <laughs> 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 what does Garrett Wong have in his abattoir? He's got... Do you think he ever gets confused about like which leg goes to which prop? Because the leg is al almost always broken off, but can be reattached. Yeah. He's got stuffed flotter. <laughs> He's got furry fly. He's got this spider. Yeah. And they all have realistic genitalia. Yeah. He's a rich man in props. Yeah. I want to see his collection. It's all under glass. I bet it's really cool. Yeah. Museum lights. Mm -hmm. it's, like, <laughs> it's like a scene in, in a Batman movie. Like he has a party <laughs> at his house and the like femme fatale kind of like breaks away from the group and wanders into the East Wing. And she's like, this is amazing. What this collection, like this should be in a museum. The public should have access to this. You have the Talaxian fur flies body and head. <laughs> and dismembered leg, <laughs> all in separate cases. You didn't bother to glue them together? Yeah, he's trying to respect the, the integrity of the patina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you don't glue those things together. You're just going to ruin it. It's kind of adding some of his own patina, if you know what I mean. He was stating the obvious again. It's clear there's been kind of a passage of time here. Like, it's suggested at this point with how well they're able to speak each other's language. Yeah. Like, that. that's happened pretty fast, right? 
Yeah, like I almost wanted them to like comment about how Nas had like really staggeringly good language mm -hmm. learning skills or something because it doesn't really seem like they're trying to learn her language. But that would kind of betray the secret of of the passage of time thing. Yeah, I guess so. That they're really obscuring here with something like this. She's stumbling through some uh, Federation standard asking Tuvok a bunch of questions, uh, you know, like, well, like what, what are your friends like back at home? Like, what do you do for work? And he's like, why are you asking so many questions? This is a sad moment because like, they're not probing questions. They're just questions that a curious person has for someone that they are living with mm -hmm. and have been for a very long time, I guess. <laughs> and Tuvok has done everything he can to suffocate an inner life out of himself as much as possible. So when you ask him anything interesting, he really doesn't have an answer for that stuff. But also that like air of mystery is like driving her mad because Paris is like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, my girlfriend back at home, blah, 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 blah. Three years, she finally wore down and Lori Petty turns back to Tuvok and goes, and what about you? <laughs> Tuvok just ignores Lori Petty and goes back to Paris and is like, you and BLT are still together? <laughs> You know, I had wondered about that all season. Yeah. All of season five, basically. Because some of the time it really does seem like you're together. And then other times it's like, do they even know each other? Have they met? Like if you were to break apart our missions into episodes, <laughs> it would feel as though your relationship is only a part of those episodes if it serves them in some way. And I know that that's kind of a weird mental framework to use because sometimes it's like, is the year of hell an entire right. mission and therefore episode? And, and that's like one year, whereas another mission might only take a day or two. It's kind of a Truman Show style sociopathy. Like, that's not what I'm trying to suggest here. It's just a kind of an easy way to think about all these adventures we've been having. <laughs> We've been rich in adventures since we got to the Delta Quadrant. You can yeah. say what you want about this quadrant. <laughs> Very adventuresome at the end of the day. So the, the dinner hang kind of wraps up. And this is a moment that's always a little bit awkward when the host and the guests are on different schedules about when they should get the fuck out. <laughs> and a really convenient way to do this if you're the host is to like go and wash the dishes. Right, right. Unless you're me... Like, sometimes I like people to stick around, but I also like washing dishes. I like to do that at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You're, uh, <laughs> you send very mixed signals. I just yeah. go to my bedroom and go to sleep. God. It's very unambiguous. I don't have that kind of bravery. <laughs> I really don't. I wish I could just fucking bail. Yeah, yeah. No, but I've, I can't. I've had parties where people had to let themselves out. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It's nice. And that's the last time they come over to a party at your house. <laughs> <laughs> so Paris has really made himself at home here and is basically expecting that this is where they're going to be parked for the rest of their lives in a way that Tuvok has not really warmed up to because like they're having this conversation where Paris is like, yeah, man, like Nas is fucking sweating you, dude. Like she, she won't say two words to me, but she like you and her are just like falling into each other's eyes. It's crazy. Are you going to do something about it? Tuvok kind of shakes Paris off with that classic explanation of like, you know, Nas has been here a long time and she's got cobwebs all up inside her heart. <laughs> <laughs> and also I'm married, bro. This does not constitute the galactic hall pass that you think it does. And there's something so unusual about how differently Tuvok and Paris feel about this. Yeah. Like, that Paris is so ready to accept his fate. He like wants to like live vicariously through Voss and Tuvok getting together. Yeah. But he's also like a little distracted by the cobweb comment. And he's like, you know, that's actually a great point. There's so many spiders here and I haven't seen a single cobweb. Are you saying they're all kind of concentrated on her, um, uh, her heart? It's crazy. This ship is so big. And all the spiders are outside. <laughs> Weird. Objection noted. We'll do this without you. Do it. Get do it. Do it. Get do it. Objection noted. We'll do this without you. Do it. Get do it. Get do it. Do it. Do it. Do it.
it seems like Paris is the logical one here. He's like, we're in a different layer of space. Like, we didn't know that this butthole was here. We fell mm-hmm. into it by total happenstance. Like, they're not coming for us, man. Paris is ready to repopulate the planet. Yeah. It's ready to go. Your attempt to play matchmaker is misguided. I am not experiencing Pon Far. Tuvok does not like this. He heads out to recalibrate their distress beacon. Yeah. Paris rolls up and he's like, look, dude, I'm sorry about what I said back there. I just got excited. I got excited because I thought about you two together. And uh, it's all I think about, quite honestly. It's kind of my new thing. Just thinking about you guys together. Pretty hot. Yeah. I was uh, I was just in some Star Trek caves over there. Do not <laughs> run a black light in those Star Trek caves either. It's fucking great that Paris rolls up to apologize and then very much does not apologize <laughs> because everything after the apology is like, you could see how I would think that, right? I've seen the way you look at her. Like everything that I said to you, like very plausible, wouldn't you say? She is ready to knock the spider webs off. Her heart <laughs> for you. <laughs> Isn't there a real line between like, because Paris believes the same thing the entire time, but his tactics change conversation to conversation. And I feel like this time around, he's like, he's kind of live in the moment guy. Right. But there is a real line between live in the moment and like living in the moment too fast. You know? Right. There are versions of living in the moment that are good, but- Tuvok never pushes back on the many times that this has bit Paris in the ass either. Right. Like that was just hanging there in a way that like, I feel like when two humans fight and when they fight ugly, one of them will go after the weak point as a justification for their actions. And I think if Tuvok were human, he would have been like, oh yeah, live in the moment. Like how you got busted down to Ensign, like how you ruin most parts of your life. Like, fuck out of here, Paris. Like, you are a terrible example of what you're trying to tell me to do. Why would I ever trust you? Maybe uh, get your own house in order before you come give me advice about how to conduct my personal life. I feel like on the one hand, that's a very logical reaction to Paris, but it's also like kind of the nuclear option yeah. on Paris. And I think Tuvok is just so reserved that he knows well enough not to go there. He goes instead back to the past, Adam. Yeah. We get another flashback of young Tuvok engaging in uh, in some pretty ugly self-hatred. Yeah. Talking about how he wishes he wasn't a Vulcan and didn't have to do Vulcan shit. Because then... Uh, this Torellian girl should be all his. The Torellian girl isn't one of the plague girls, right? I feel like the Torellians were the uh, the take on me aliens. Were they? Right? Oh, man. That sounds familiar. Maybe they cured the Torellian virus by the time uh, Tuvok and her went to school together. Man. Maybe Tuvok was vaccinated against the Torellian virus. Because Tuvok is super old, right? He's like 90? Yeah, but you know what they say, dude. Vulcan don't crack. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, you know who was Torellian? That lady in that bar that knew Malota. Oh, oh, well now I know why Tuvok likes Torellians. Yeah. Because you can get a four-hand job <laughs> from a Torellian, right? <laughs> God, the, a Torellian can play the trombone and also <laughs> honk on those tits. <laughs> <laughs> like what's the musical instrument that's like the uh there was a sketch and i think you should leave Two, remember three, with the guy four. breaking the plates what's the instrument with like the the cymbals and the piano and the organ and the yeah you know what i'm talking about uh, i think it's the i think you should leave a phone my condolences but yeah, that's an alien who could play that instrument ably, and also that body. Mm, yeah. So we really understand Yang Tuvok, but his mentor does not, and uh, is trying to, you know, dissuade him from the path of illogic. And he's like, "I actually got a letter from your dad that she doesn't even like you." That's not helpful, right? No. Love is a dangerous emotion. It may seem positive, but all these secondary effects of jealousy and grief and anger and et cetera 
are associated with it. You could say love is the gateway emotion, mm. Ben, because once you start with love, I mean, then you're doing heroin. Yeah. Like almost immediately. Cutting up rails of rage. Yeah. Just doing key bumps of horny. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do that he's like if you don't believe that love is a bad emotion ultimately try turning on a black light in this cave do you think this is love rehab and do you think this teacher is like a rehabilitation coordinator mm-hmm. this scene reads as differently if this is like kind of a standard thing that Vulcans go to when they're struggling with certain uh, addictions. Yeah, like a, listen, man, I was just like you when I was your age. Uh I've done it all. (laughs) Dude, you wouldn't even believe it. I had a crush on two girls at the same time in high school. (laughs) It sucked. Neither of them knew my name, but it was bad for me, man. (laughs) And one of them was Terrellian, so there were six arms involved in this crash. <laughs> I couldn't stop thinking about what all those arms could do to me. <laughs> the different parts of my body they could explore all at once. Adam, would you like to check in with the Starship Voyager, see what they're up to amidst all this? I had wondered what they were up to while weeks and weeks had gone by down on the surface. Like, we cut over to Voyager and they've made it home. (laughs) (laughs) We were flying through space and there was like this really intense gravity well, but then right next to it was a wormhole. And we just kind of flew right past that gravity well for the wormhole. And what do you know? It let us out right in Sector 001. Could you blame us? (laughs) We made it home with almost everyone, you know? Yeah. Sure. Lon Suter didn't make it. Tuvok, the other guy, Ensign, what's his name? Hey, I think you're probably happy that we didn't bring Lon Tudor with us. Am I right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The whole Alpha Quadrant kind of heaved a sigh of relief when they found that out. Yeah. You know, in many ways, the caretaker did us all a favor. It's true. We realized that it has been one hour since their shuttle disappeared on Voyager. Yeah. Talk about going back to the past. Yeah. Speaking of things happening very quickly, a banger gets dropped almost immediately after we're back on Voyager, and then the ship is in the process of being sucked into this space butthole, and they can't escape using their engines or thrusters, Ben. No. It's going to take Janeway thinking fast and uh, telling them a bunch of isodynes to vent or whatever. This is like what you do as a captain. You're just running down your checklist of weird things to implement to escape a butthole. I like them all just going like, that's why you got the four pips, Janeway. (laughs) Holy shit. That was close. (laughs) Yeah. She doesn't even do the suggestions thing that Picard used to do all the time. She's got the suggestions. She knows exactly how to get out of this. And uh, they're like, all right, well, that must be where the shuttle went. They fell into that sinkhole. So let's head down to the ass lab and talk about what uh, we do to get them out of it. Seven's got a whole schematic fired up that shows, you know, a representation of the Hull and the solar system that's in there. Yeah, they get the gape up on screen. A sun and three planets in this hole. There's kind of a lot in there. Yeah. Kind of a lot that this hole could fit up in it. I'd say it's time to break out the multispatial probe. Agreed. Yeah. This is like why colonics became popular, you know? Right. Clean it all out, you know? There's stuff in there that, that just stays. Yeah, but I mean, uh, there's also good planets in there, too, that you probably don't want to disturb, right? Yeah, I mean, I've heard that some people get planet transplants Mm. these days. Yeah. It sounds gross, but it can totally change your whole deal. Yeah. I mean, they're not putting planets into you. They're putting little bits of planets into, like, a a pill capsule that you eat. You eat it? Yeah. I thought that you consumed it suppository style. Who would know, Ben? I mean, I didn't get that far in my uh, acid <laughs> reflux journey. <laughs> You're still at the poop sombrero stage. Yeah. I am, uh, I'm many miles down the road. <laughs> well, I've got to get that platinum. Get that roll bed lodgement. <laughs> I've got to get that platinum. Would not. Are you planning a heist? Gold. I'm giving you an order. I'm giving you an order. Is that understood? I'm giving you an order. I'm giving you, and you have just crossed the line. There's a banger again. 
Yeah. Ben, it seems like we just can't seem to have a meeting without a banger. Yeah, Chicote is saying like uh, something about a special probe that they have while this banger hits them, and they they, they go up on the bridge, and Harry is in the middle of trying to like talk stern to whoever's on FaceTime with him. I'm only gonna say this one more time. Disengage your tractor beam, sir. Do you think they intend this comedy? Because Kim is like a kid answering the house phone when the parents are working in the backyard. Because <laughs> when Janeway comes in mid-call, you gotta believe she thinks that's cute. Yeah, it, it is cute. The, the guy that they're talking to looks like those muggers down yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Why the long face, Mr. Yost? Yeah. He's very upset. Supervisor Yost is uh, basically like a interstellar contractor, right? He's got like a license from the city to repair potholes. And uh, he's out here with a truck full of asphalt. And uh, he's about to start pouring it into this hole and then uh, run it over with a, a compactor. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. We got friends in that hole. I used to live in a neighborhood right next to a yard full of AAA tow trucks. Whoa. Like 50 of them. And they would just deploy around the city and just park. Just park <laughs> on the side of the road waiting. Yeah. And I feel like that's what Mr. Yost is doing. Like he's parked by this space boat hole, ready to tow a ship out of its gravity well. And that's what he's, he, he's kind of indignant about this. He's like, I just saved your buns. From going up in that hole yeah. with my tractor beam. You should show a little gratitude. And also, we're going to pave over this thing tomorrow. Yeah. So. And they're like, hey, can you not? Because, like, we're trying to get our friends out of there. And he's like, you're not going to. Like, we've lost dozens of friends in this hole. That's why we're paving over it. Like, you know, say your goodbyes. Yeah. They're gone. They're gone, baby, gone. Also gone is the shot of Mr. Yost's ship which is cool as hell looking, and we only see it for like a second. Yeah. Are they not proud of this ship? The ship was cool. Yeah. So Janeway, like, she's now working under a deadline, and she gets Chakotay to work on this probe job immediately. Yeah. Chakotay, I'll need you to work on the probe job using as little dialogue as possible. <laughs> you may go. <laughs> you know what straw you pulled this season. <laughs> <laughs> you appear to be working on other projects as an actor. That's the only explanation I can come up with. <laughs> Just be thankful you aren't Neelix, who has maybe even less to do, but has to sit in the makeup chair for four times as long. Yeah. In the ready room, we cut to later, where Chakotay uses what little dialogue he has to tell Janeway that uh, they found the distress beacon from the missing shuttle. And it's on a planet inside the butthole. And I love the flair for the dramatic that Chakotay has because he could use dialogue to tell her all about this. <laughs> but instead, he gives her the pad to read herself, yeah. giving her the gift of her own dialogue to use in this scene. And, uh, you know, that's just the kind of generosity that he's bringing to bear as a character, you know? As an actor, also. It's a lot like uh, sort of what Nas wishes Tuvok would do, you know? Mm hmm Yeah. Like, you know, Nas is looking at Tuvok going, like, I bet that guy could carve a mean bathtub. <laughs> There's not even a suggestion of a bathtub no. on a desert planet that I think could really use one. You know, it's heated by the sun. Yeah. Very efficient. It's not going to be anytime soon, even if he wanted to, because... Uh, Paris comes in the front door with Tuvok in the next scene, and Tuvok is fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. He was attacked by spiders. They, they turn on the doctor, and it's the first time the doctor has been active in two months. Two months? Yeah. So, what's new? And he gets to work on Tuvok, and Tuvok's going to pull through. It's going to be okay. He scans Tuvok. He's like, has he been trying to fuck a spider hole? <laughs> His genitals are totally shredded. And Nas is like, damn it, I wanted to do that. The spiders have rendered his penis completely unusable. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nas. She goes outside and it's raining and she falls to her knees. Goes, no! We gotta hunt down those penis-biting spiders. <laughs> 
it's dinner time and I'm hungry for penis biting spiders. <laughs> <laughs> She does that thing where she's like nursing him back to health and goes in for a kiss because he's like so yeah. tender and vulnerable. And he's like, you really can't do that. No way. You got to ask. It sucks to watch Tuvok break her heart. And not because it sucks to watch anyone's heart get broken, but like the very unique way that a Vulcan does it, which yeah. has got to drive someone fucking nuts. Because like his calmness in the face of her... When you're when you're crushing on someone and you've like made the move, you're energized. Yeah. By that attempt. And for Tuvok to not only turn her down, but also turn her down in a way that almost feels like he's about to fall asleep. Oh, that calmness just makes her so angry. <laughs> she she is like a runaway truck going down the grapevine, hitting that ramp that's made out of gravel. You know? You know, like when your wife wants to fight and you just don't want to fight? Like <laughs> And it drives her fucking mad. Um, you know what that's like, right? I don't think so. Do a lot of marriages experience that? That's like this. <laughs> Shut up, God! Insulting me will not help. Yeah. Really pisses her off. Yeah. <laughs> you know. She doesn't want his shredded spider junk anymore. Yeah. The spiders can have your dick, she says, <laughs> and she storms out. <laughs> yeah. We're back on the Voyager for just like... A moment where we learn that they can use a probe to kind of amplify their ability to use the transporters and also communicate. But at the same time, the work of sealing the space butthole has begun. Yeah. Supervisor Yost is uh, already starting up the uh, cement mixer and they're like, wait, 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 we had six hours. And he's like, no, we're ready now, man. Yeah. This is a shocking development. I I had a trade come to my house 30 minutes before they said the window had begun. <laughs> it totally fucked me up. <laughs> like, I absolutely understand the incredulity that Janeway is feeling here. Like, I thought you said the window was between 10 and noon. It is 9.30. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? I am losing my mind. I've interacted with... I don't know, a dozen trades since I moved and no one has even hit the window. They've been an hour <laughs> behind the window. 30 minutes early? What the fuck is this? What is going on? Oh, man. You know, I had that cable guy come out to my house a couple of weeks ago to fix yeah. our internet. Uh-huh. And then, like, the internet still was kind of shitty. Yeah. I wound up on the phone with, I think, the guy who supervises him a couple of times. Did you ask for a supervisor or did this just happen? No, the supervisor called me because I'd like called back to report that we were still having problems. Uh-huh. And then the other day I was walking the dog and I saw the first cable guy <laughs> in the neighborhood at another house. And I was like, hey, man. And he gave me nothing back. I was like, oh, fuck. I got you in trouble, didn't I? <laughs> LA is so big. And you tend to run into people I don't all know. the time. <laughs> I'm so unlucky. I'm so, it sucks. <laughs> you should have tried doing a bit there, Ben. I should have tried a bit. How's that bamboo working out for you? Yeah. Did I tell you about that? <laughs> we were sitting here recording an episode of the show, and I looked into my backyard, which the window in my studio is onto our backyard, and I saw him back there like two days after he'd been here to fix the cable. And there's like some downed bamboo in the backyard and he just like points over at it. And I'm like, I gave him like a thumbs up. And then I looked over like two minutes later and he's walking out of the backyard with like an armful of like 10 or 12 pieces of like 12 foot long bamboo pieces. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I understand. So you had cable guy business a few days before at no point. Did the cable guy mention anything about the bamboo? And then that same cable guy comes back two days later, points at the bamboo. You give him the universal sign of go ahead and take as much as you want. And he wordlessly does it. He pointed at the back of the yard, which is where the like telephone pole the, that the cable is on was. And I assumed that he was like back and saying like, I need to do something to the pole. Yeah. What he was here to do was take bamboo. <laughs> I mean, I'm. it's fine. I don't need it. 
I didn't need the bamboo. Why would that guy be mad at you? You gave him bamboo. That's like a 10th anniversary gift <laughs> for your cable guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he got in trouble or if he didn't recognize me or what, but I'm bamboo guy and you put some respect on my name. Tuvok is meditating on the edge of a cliff that is great scouting, Yeah. right? I don't know how long it takes you to find the perfect meditation cliff, but this is it because it's reachable from the bottom. It's not a huge climb for Paris to walk up to. It looks like it was placed there for this use. It's the perfect setting. It's giving Lion King pride rock. Yeah. But it's like not as big and, and intimidating. It's really great. Yeah. I thought Tuvok might have been shirtless here. No, he's in the uh, the tank top of trying to clear his mind after a bunch of spiders attacked his dick. There is another layer to the Starfleet uniform. Underneath the mutiny shirt, yeah. there's the plunging U yeah. of that tank top. Yeah. Looks nice. It looks great. He's keeping it tight. He's not going to have a lot of luck clearing his mind, though, because... Paris is here, and Paris is pissed off about how how badly Tuvok has hurt Nas. Try to let her down easy. There is no easy way to recover from infatuation. Nas is shredded by this, as shredded as Tuvok's penis is. <laughs> Paris is like, we came to this party to meet girls, <laughs> and you fucking scared him away by being a weirdo. <laughs> this happens all the time. Man. You suck to party with, man. You show one of these girls your weird shredded dick. <laughs> and now they all left. That's not what girls like. <laughs> <laughs> the other element to this is, isn't the way that Tuvok has treated Nas. It's the way Tuvok is treating Paris. Because Paris can tell that Tuvok maybe wants to say something but can't yeah. about why he cannot return the affection of Nas. And... Paris really riles Tuvok up, riles him all the way up to the point where he can finally tell Paris about Jara, the love of his youth. Yeah. I feel like Tuvok really needs to check his fettered emotional privilege, though, because everybody else is hurting. Also, everyone has had that first heavy crush. Yeah. That's all you need to say, Tuvok. Middle school. Yeah. Pelican brief. We, we all had our Jackie. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. The emotional attraction I felt for her became a kind of insanity. He tells Paris he spent months in a uh, sex rehab. <laughs> Some Star Trek caves with a lot of torches and gongs. Which is what makes the shredding of the penis by the spiders all the more traumatic. <laughs> I made it through that whole thing unscathed. Yeah. <laughs> now look at me. <laughs> I left sex rehab with a functional penis. And now I'm looking down at a bunch of ribbons. Looks like a cat of nine tails hanging, <laughs> hanging off me. It's like a ribbon station at a greeting card store. This is sort of what I picture your life being like, Adam, because they look up at the sky and they see that, that great big hole. Oh in orbit of the planet, and they see the, like, explosive yeah. energy coming through it. Yeah, they're pushing in yeah. a bad way. Yeah. Should not have to strain like this. No. We see what this looks like from the other side. It's this, as you said, very cool ship shooting rays at the gravity well. The reason I love this ship, it's kind of an, an Event Horizon-class ship, right? It's got that long neck, yeah. big bulb at the front. Yeah. Yeah. The wings. It's sort of like a child's drawing of a spaceship most of the time, right? Yeah. If you look down on it from above, it's a crucifix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unclear whether or not it's a tomb yeah. aboard. Who knows how Mr. Yost keeps a ship? <laughs> they get the distress signal. They've got to speed it up. I love the speeding up the tape. Wait. 
A transporter beam with a radius of two meters will activate at the coordinates of your distress beacon in exactly 30 minutes. And I also love how they're like, oh, fuck, like we missed the window before yeah. Janeway gets to the part about the time dilation issue. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. The, the dilation's a problem in a number of areas yeah. in this episode. Yeah. So uh, it's a two-day wait for them and a 29-minute wait for Voyager. And uh, this is just in time for, like, for some reason, all of the bad guys on this planet to mount, like, a coordinated effort to yeah. take over their crashed ship and get through the force field. These aliens are tired of eating spiders. They want whatever is on NASA's ship. They want meat to be back on the menu, boys. Oh, you think they want to eat Nas and Tuvok in Paris? Yeah. And they're like, it would have been better if we'd done this before his dick got shredded because that would have been that much more meat. But this will have to do. Yeah, the Vulcan penis is mostly gristle and fat anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, but you can use that to like grease the pan, you know, render it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you just you take the rolled up Vulcan penis into your tongs and you just kind of uh rub it around the pan. Rub it on the on the grill if you're if you're cooking outside. Yeah. They've got to defend them. It's like a siege for for 2 days. We're getting down to the wire. We kind of cut back and forth and it's like, "Oh, only a couple more minutes on Voyager." And it's like, "Only a, only a day and a half left down on the yeah. planet." And uh, they're getting really, really close, and Nas has to go out and, like, shore up the shield that's protecting them. And uh, it looks like she's going to get killed, and Tuvok rides to her rescue one more time, even though it's illogical for both of them to go. And they all get beamed out just in time. How about Nas, like, throwing this in Tuvok's face? Yeah. Risking two lives would be illogical. She knows how to argue, doesn't she? Yeah. Just the twist of the rhetorical knife right there. A very familiar thing, I'm, I'm sure, to you as well as me, is, the, uh, is yep. the lady saving that for a couple days to drop yeah. on you. <laughs> kind of using your reasoning against you. Yeah. And your shredded penis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, they get beamed out of there like just in the nick of time, just before they're totally overrun by these... Loafy guys. I really wanted there to be like a, a moment after the gravity well was closed, but you know, Janeway had succeeded in their rescue. Like, hey, uh, Supervisor Yost, uh, sorry to say, we did figure out a way to rescue people from the other side. So, like, a lot of your, a lot of your people just got sealed in there forever. Yee. Yeah. Janeway's instinct is occasionally to spike the ball, and she doesn't do that here. No. Mostly because to spike the ball would be just very sad. It really would be. Hope you like eating spiders. Yeah. Voyager takes Nas back to the planet she comes from, and uh, they're headed down to uh, say their goodbyes, and uh, Paris catches up with Tuvok in the hallway, and uh, he's like, yeah, man, it's so fucking weird. Like, I spent months and months convinced that I was never going to see my sweetheart again. I guess you were right on that one. Yeah. There's temporal jet lag. Tuvok is like, wait, you have a girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paris is is almost delighted by how strange the sensation is. Yeah, yeah. Of this situation. But as confusing as the temporal jet lag might be for Paris, he knows exactly what to do in the transporter room because when they see Nas off... He has the good sense to clear the room of everyone so that Tuvok and Nas can have a moment alone together. I think it should be standard practice to ask somebody before you meld them. You know, even if there's sort of an implied meld relationship. I feel like you were talking about this a while ago when it comes to like making the first move of kissing a person. Yeah. Like when we were growing up kissing people, you didn't ask like yeah. no one did you just go in and you get rejected or you go in and you get accepted and that's kind of how it was i learned my lesson the hard way that you should ask <laughs> yeah like and this is like that version yeah. of melding yeah tuvac goes in because he thinks he's got the clear 
signals and and he does. And what happens during that meld is some real intimacy. It really is. I guess he shares everything he's been going through with her. You know, she smiles on the other side of the meld and is like, wow, like, okay, no further questions. Uh, I got it. I mean, I thought I knew what a shredded penis would feel like, (laughs) but now that I kind of lived with the feeling personally (laughs) for a moment, ouch, ouch. Anyways, gotta go. (laughs) Didn't swell, but swelling's gone down. This is Lori Petty being... Lori Petty, though, because like when she gets up on the pad, she does that thing where they're like holding hands for a moment. And when they let go, she keeps her arm out like for a beat in a way that is really heartbreaking. And does that big exhale that's like the emotions are like thickening up my exhale and this. God, she's she's fucking incredible. She's so great at this. Like. She's a a truly expressive face actor. It's one of the ways that she's great, but like her body acting here is another element to it that just makes the scene heartbreaking at the end. really is. Tuvok has to meditate on this, and uh, he meditates his way back to his time in the cave with the Vulcan master and like his graduation ceremony, essentially. Yeah. When you can snatch the issue of... Big Vulcan naturals out of my hand. (laughs) You can leave the temple. (laughs) And he does. And that's why that issue was so important in the shuttle. He always travels with it. Mm -hmm. Even though the pages have long since fused irrevocably together. They're like dry leaves. You can barely touch it. It's bagged and boarded. (laughs) Uh, And that's the episode. Did you like this episode of Star Trek Voyager, Adam? You know, I'm really easy to get along with most of the time. But I don't like bullying. I don't like friends. And I don't like you. I I mean, I love, love, love Lori Petty. And so the excitement of watching an episode where she's a featured guest. And you've never seen Tank Girl? Yeah, I know. I haven't. What the fuck? Let's do it! You know, I kind of slept on Lori Petty for a while, and then she popped up in Station Eleven, and I was like, oh my god, she is fucking great. Like, if you haven't seen that show, make some time for it, because she is especially great in that show. But, um, yeah. Is that that Armando Iannucci space show? No. Oh. It's on HBO. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to describe. Okay, here's the slug line. Survivors of a devastating flu attempt to rebuild and reimagine the world anew Hmm. while holding on to the best of what's been lost. Oh. So the sort of thing you want to watch in 2001. (laughs) (laughs) Which is how we were doing it. Yeah. (laughs) She's special. And uh, I think she elevated the episode. Like, I think, obviously, it's a Tuvok episode, and it is nice to give Tim Russ the ball. But in the same way that Kate Mulgrew had to play off of the Chris Isaac guest actor, like that steel sharpening steel of their relationship a few episodes ago, like you get Lori Petty and Tim Russ together, like that's some more actor sharpening in a way that I just really like. So yeah, I like the episode a lot. Yeah, I did too. I think it's um, a show that just feels like incredibly confident in its storytelling ability right now. The opening in a deep flashback and then like reopening on a strange planet with a character we've never met before being our main character at the beginning. Yeah. And then like not even introducing the crew of the Voyager into the story until like past the halfway mark of the episode, Mm -hmm. you know, not worrying about our ability to engage with it as an audience. uh, Despite all that just feels like, super cool and um I, yeah i've just really been loving this season and uh i love this episode in particular great app terry wendell is the director of this episode it's the first of 10 that he ends up directing for voyager wow and this was a, a tough one to do i think you got your on ship stuff you've got your out in the field work i think we can assume that he did a great job here yeah because he was brought back so many times so good job by him Indeed. Well, Adam, do you want to see if there's anything in the Priority One inbox today? 
Oh yeah, I'm gonna head that way. I'm gonna walk through the desert, avoiding dick ripping spiders. Good luck. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Need a supplemental income. Supplemental income? Supplemental. Supplemental. Yeah, it's extra. By the interest alone could be enough to buy this ship. The first priority one message, Ben. It's of a personal nature. It's from Doug C. It's to Adam and Ben. The message goes like this. Love you guys. Love this cast. Thanks for keeping me company on the Colorado Trail and the AT. Here's a hundred scarves to answer a dumb fan question. Um, yeah, in Lower Deck Season 3, Episode 9, we see Breccia 4 for the first time. It had palm trees and looked like Miami. But in TNG Season 1, Episode 22, the Breccians wore hilarious 80s Miami clothes. Was this an intentional callback to Judson Scott's wardrobe? (laughs) Get a light. God damn, Doug C. That is a great convention question. That is solid as Sears. You should uh, get off those trails and get to a convention. Yeah, I think this is just the sort of thing a Q&A session needs to hear. Something I'd like to hear. Yeah, and then take your answer back on the trail, you know? Go get a $14 hot dog and uh, take your answer over there. Is the, is the AT the Appalachian Trail? That's gotta be, right? He hiked both the Colorado Trail and the Appalachian Trail? Doug C is no joke. Yeah, check out the calves on Doug C. <laughs> Love to do that someday. I mean, he mentioned nothing about hiking it. Maybe you took a doom buggy. Everybody's <laughs> <laughs> like, get off the trail! <laughs> yeah, check out Doug C's terrible calves. <laughs> <laughs> Our next priority one message here is from T-Bear, and it's to Kalen, and it goes like this. Merry Christmas, Kalen. I'm so proud of you and all that you've accomplished. You have worked so hard, and it is definitely paying off. You mean so much to people, your students, community, and family. It's amazing to see you take on the world. Here's to more Star Trek plots that I don't understand, writing D&D campaigns, and cursed audiophile emails. Well, I'm really glad T-Bear and Kalen celebrate Christmas on February 20th. <laughs> it's unusual. Yeah. But but for some people, Christmas does come in February. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Merry Christmas, Kalen. You sound great. T-Bear sounds great, too. Yeah. Cursed audiophile emails. Oof. Yuck. That's terrifying. Yeah. Is T-Bear short for trail bear? Are they also hiking? <laughs> T-Bear's the one yelling at Doug Z to get the dune buggy <laughs> off the trail. I was having coffee with Danny Baruela this morning, and I was like, hey, you know, with uh, inflation being what it is, maybe we should bump the price of those uh, priority one messages. And he was like, huh, yeah, that's actually not a terrible idea. So uh, <laughs> if you're listening to this and they haven't gone up yet, I would say get them now. Jeez. Because I put that idea into the network. See, I thought you were trying to do a favor for the Friends of DeSoto, like inflation making everything more expensive. Maybe we lower the price of P1s so no. that they're more attainable. No, we're it's costing us more money to do all this shit, too. All right. I guess. <laughs> this is... Fuck you, man. I come up with one little idea to charge $110 instead you know, of $100. It costs money to fix our, our Miriam digestive issues. You're right. We need as much as we can get. This show's not lasting forever. These dicks aren't going to shred themselves, Adam. Yeah, indeed. Well, if you'd like to get a priority one message on the show, it's super, super easy to do. Go to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron and set it up today. Hey, Ben. <laughs> What's that, Adam? <laughs> Did you find yourself a Drunk Shimoda? Incredible. Drunk Shimoda! Yeah, I'm going to give it to uh, Supervisor Yost for just being, like, so unwilling. Like, this was a very Douglas Adams character. Like, 
I have a job. I'm just like a construction guy and we're on a schedule and I don't really care about your thing. Yeah. Bad-tempered, bureaucratic, officious, and callous. I thought it was very funny how little of a fuck he gave about the Voyager. <laughs> but that's like an expression of, of a quality you've said before. Like, great characters are written to be the main characters of their own lives. Yeah. And this guy's got a job to do, and he's just going to get it done. He has an inner life and an inner career, and he doesn't give a shit about what Voyager's going through. I'm doing my construction project, and I'm not doing that. I'm reading Vogon poetry, and those are the only two things I give a shit about. Yeah. How about you? Mine's going to be Tom Paris, just because I think it's fairly suspicious how invested he is in someone else's relationship. I think think what it's doing is betraying how flimsy his own is. Hmm. Why don't you keep your eyes on your own work, Paris? Yeah, yeah. Stop trying to get Tuvok's dick into more danger. Yeah, you see what happens? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Good Shimoda. Is Lori Petty going to be in the next episode, Ben? You find that out while I go over to the Game of Buttholes, The Will of the Caretaker. Okay, well, our next episode is Season 5, Episode 14, Bliss. The crew is elated to discover a wormhole that appears to lead directly to Earth. Season five is just the uh, oops all wormholes season. There's a lot. Is that what we're dealing with? A lot, a lot of wormholes in season five, it seems like. Kind of a lot of wormholes. Talk to me about this board game, Adam. What's happening? Well, would you believe we're smack dab in the middle of two special squares? I do believe that. Directly behind us is a Janeway square. If you had hit that, we would have zoomed up to the top of the board. That didn't happen. Instead, directly ahead, we've got a Neelix's Galley square. Oh, boy. Which is a square in which you and I drink Talaxian champagne. Wow. Which, if we can't get Talaxian champagne, we substitute... Regular. Earth champagne. Mm -hmm. Or you just do, like, whatever bottle of wine you have around... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. You're required to learn as you play. Roll. Maybe a, a tiki drink. Mm. Probably not, though. That's its own square, man. Ben. What? I have rolled a one. A <laughs> <laughs> It's the antidote. <laughs> How do you only ever roll ones? And for the first time... In a long time, we've hit a very special square. Yeah. You know what that means. We're dropping bottles on the show next week. Wow. Holy shit. It's Talaxian champagne time. Sure is. Man, well. Buckle up. I guess I got to go buy some Talaxian champagne. Do you know anywhere in LA that sells it? Hmm. I think your cable guy knows. (laughs) You should ask him. (laughs) We're not really on speaking terms right now. Yeah, it does seem like that. We got a a bunch of people that we need to thank for all of the assistance that we get in making the show every week. Of course, the most helpful of all are the Friends of DeSoto who support the show. Getting ready for this Max Fun Drive. It's coming right up, and uh, we could really use your support this year. It's maximumfun.org slash join. Get your engines ready. So much goes into the completion of every episode. Can't do it alone. Takes a village of FODs, Ben. Truly does. To steer an episode into port. Gotta thank our producer, first and foremost, Windy Pretty. We do. Chops and screws our episodes into form. Makes us sound funnier than we are. Yeah, just just slows the beat down. Yeah. Sounds real nasty. She does great work here. So does Bill Tilly. He's the social media manager. You can find him wherever social media happens online. The uh, the hashtag greatest gen or greatest trek. Yeah. Those are kind of like the bat signals to finding other FODs wherever you are, where hashtags are accepted. I also want to give a special shout out to the Discord at drunkshimoda.com. That is a vast FOD resource. It's like a city of FODs. Lively community. Talking about all kinds of things. Yeah. I also want to shout out the uh, Wikia, greatestgen.wikia.com. Fun resource over there. Shows uh, a lot of the antecedents to runners that we do on the show. 
So if you're a new listener, that could be kind of a fun thing to look through, get, get up to speed on some weird shit we say. Lots of ways to support the show. Uh, a review is a great way to do it. You can also buy merch at podshop.biz. Podshop.biz? Yeah, lots of our in-jokes end up on merch items there. Yeah. Got a couple of new new items in there at the moment that I think you'd enjoy. That's true. With that, we will be back at you next week with another great episode of Star Trek Voyager and another episode of The Greatest Generation Voyager where you know we're asking whether the Voyager would even be allowed back in the Alpha Quadrant carrying as many flotter toys as they are. Oh, yeah, that's a suspicious amount of flatter toys. You mean you were on rations for your rear replicator and yet you kept making flatter toys? What the fuck? <laughs> mm. Make it so. Fun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned, audience supported.